Yep. Ready? Okay. Good evening, everyone. The Lord blessing be upon you all, and it's good to see you all once again. Uh, glad everybody could be on as I see others are getting on. Uh, do want to give you time to get in, get settled, and sh don't forget to share your your screen. Uh, I'm not share your screen, but share your your uh, link so others can get on. Gonna have a word of prayer, and then we will get kicked off and get ready to move out with tonight's lesson. Our Father, our Lord, we give you thanks and praise. We for another day. Thank you for life, health, and strength being as well as it is. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so that you left on record the road map to life. Thank you for those who have found uh, the old pathway. We pray that we will mark it out and be able to follow it along. Uh, we ask your blessing as we study tonight. No familiar thing that affect all of us. We give you thanks and praise. We ask that you remember those who may be traveling, those who are trying to get on. Uh, we pray especially for our group, our group leaders, that they would uh, be on and do the things that have been asked for them. But we realize, Lord, it's your program, and it's, uh, you're the one, you're the author and finish. And so we ask your effectiveness on it. And if you do it for us, we'll never be careful to give you praise, we'll give you honor, and we'll give you glory. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, uh, again, we are following up. And we're moving, walking in grief, and we're moving forward with our lesson. And uh, we do thank and praise you for being here. Grief is a funny thing. Um, the Mayo Clinic uh, actually describes it as grief is a strong, sometimes overwhelming emotion for people, regardless of whether their sadness stems from a loss of a loved one or from terminal diagnosis or uh, someone that they love receive a terminal diagnosis. Grief is a natural reaction to loss. So in the context in which we were studying Psalm 116, it is in the context mainly of death, but it's applicable to a lot more than death. My point is grief uh, can, like you say, be a prognosis of sickness, uh, and it is something, for instance, that we all experience, whether we realize it or not. The key to it is not to get stuck in. There is uh, about eight different stages, depending on who you're talking about, with grief. They come at different times. They don't come in order, and they don't give you no warning as to when they're going to come. Uh, one of the things that bring about grief that may have not been uh, part in years past is the mobile society. One in five people now move every year. And this mobileness, and, and a lot of it comes from co uh, companies, and it seems as though companies have adopted the military. Military strategy was always move, 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 move. And a lot of companies now move, and they count that as what they call upward mobility. But when you're moving every two to three years, uh, matter of fact, uh, the chaplain uh, that we had here recently at the uh, VA, Tracy Barnett, who preached for us a couple of times, good friend, uh, he was here about six months, moved back to San Antonio, had been in the military, promised his wife that if they bought a house, which they did <laughs> in, in San Antonio, that they would move again. He moved to West Palm Beach. Job came, opened it again in San Antonio and back to San Antonio. Uh, they had one child that is still in school age. But my point is, when you move, it affects everybody. Because if you got children, uh, you have made friends, loved ones, churches, everything. That is also grief. Uh, another thing that we may not see as grief is divorce. And not only that, uh, divorce, and that's why you need divorce care. Uh, divorce is another source of grief. Even the process that leads up to divorce, there is a thing called, uh, let me see, how do they say it? Uh, mental divorce happened before physical divorce. Uh, all of those things are things that add grief to society. Retirement, l leading up to retirement, even in retirement, uh, it is part of that brings that change of life. 
uh, at retirement. That's a high time in pastoral counseling for divorce uh, because of the grief that goes along with it. Corbett, uh, it has speeded up the retirement. Uh, and sometimes the only thing people live for is their job. All of that uh, leads to, to retirement. Uh, business, the recession we see in, permanent layoffs now coming. And if you're probably 50, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood, 50 or more, you get laid off now, it's going to probably be over with for you, that, uh, <laughs> that working career. All of those things add grief, and you can grieve even um, ahead of time, uh, waiting on a job opening. You've been working hard. You did everything you should have done. And as soon as you think you're going to get promotion, uh, the boss realized that his niece need a job, and uh, you don't get the promotion. Brings on uh, grief again. Uh, children lost through marriage, empty nester. That brings on grief. You look around. Uh, they get married. They take everything. They're gone. That brings on grief. And uh, so those things. And then to double down on that grief, they leave, and you, th you get over the grief, and you hear a knock on the door, and guess who's coming back? Grief all over again. <laughs> but those things, those are real life issues that we have to, we have to deal with. Um, uh, we're looking at... Uh, Grief now in uh, America is completely divided. Uh, president still haven't conceded, uh, still not planning on leaving. Uh, lawsuits are being filed, racial profiling, um, all of the, the things that are going on, police brutality, um, and then as black fathers, and I know the mothers too, we think about our children and what could happen to them. Uh, the Corvette now, people are dealing with that, the vaccine, whether to take it or not to take it. Um, 286,000 uh, deaths and climbing, um, hunger one in six. So all of those things are things that are grief. So grief affects everybody. I said all that to say this so that you wouldn't believe that grief is only about death. It is death. But the point of it is, a high point of grief is death. And if you can deal with that, you should be able to take that same process. And uh, I just want you to know, the bottom line is, no matter what it is and how you deal with it, you still got to depend on God. He is the only solution to our grief. And so I just want to say that as we push aside, you got some questions, you got some things you need to look at. And uh, we do, again, encourage you to get on as soon as possible. TJ is going to separate uh, you all, and you should be in good condition to do just that. All right. Now, you should have uh, received a lesson uh, for those uh, and again, if you're not receiving a lesson, you need to put it in the box so that uh, our media team can see it and be able to, to, um, to get the lesson to you on time. So we've been having walking in grief. Um, God responds to our sorrow and grace and compassion. We're looking at Psalm 116, verses 9, 1 through 9, and verses... Uh, 15 through 17. So there are some some uh, some that. So if you're on, you should have had it. And for those who don't have it, I'm gonna ask you a question: Is there a movie that make you cry? Is there a movie that make you cry? Think about that. Uh, is there any movie uh, that you know of that might make you cry? Some people, I won't call no names. Every movie almost make them cry. You almost have to have a a roll of a uh, couple of uh, uh, boxes of Kleenexes to watch a movie. So that's that. That's what I want to lead off with. And as you comment uh, on that, uh, I would appreciate it. But sometimes movies will make us cry. Uh, but anyway, if you can. Now we're going to look at this particular passage of uh, tonight in a little bit uh, depth. Uh, 
Psalm 116, verses 1 through 4. I'll read that and kind of go through it uh, and do the exposition. Um, I love the Lord because he heard my voice and my supplication because he had inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. Uh, the sorrow of death compassed me. The pains of Sheol uh, grabbed the hold to me. Uh, I found uh, trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord, and I beseech thee to deliver my soul. So that is the, the first section uh, that we're dealing with. The, the psalmist, uh, he starts off, and uh, he calls on God when he is in sorrow. So that is very instructive because we should do the same thing. We should call on the Lord uh, when we're in sorrow. Uh, and he makes a, um, an affirmation, I love the Lord. And we know love is a relationship type thing. Uh, it's personal. He loved the covenant God, Yahweh, uh, and uh, he wanted to reciprocate his loyalty. The poet, the psalmist, states the reason for his expression of love. Now, it is good to hear someone say that they love you. Every now and then, people need to hear that, you know, they're loved. Also, they need to be shown, and it should not be all I tell you and no showing. It shouldn't be all showing and no telling. But he says here, because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. He was saying, listen. We need not read into this that this is the only reason that he loved the Lord. He is saying this in this particular situation he was in, it uh, increased his love for the Lord. Uh, he'll build on that later. He said, he heard my uh, voice. Now, what do it mean to be heard? Uh, it's not just the ringing of the outer ear that goes in and translate in your brain. He gave attention to it. He bowed down. He stopped what he was doing, uh, running the universe, and, and, and listened to him. And God don't really have to stop what he's doing, but he's able to hear. Uh, he emphasized uh, what we want to understand is that this word in the grammar, it is in an ongoing state. He just didn't hear me and keep on uh, asking me what did I say, but he keep on hearing us. He don't hear us one time. But he keep on hearing us. It's a continued voice. Uh, and, and he denotes that speaking. Again, I mentioned on Sunday because that was a popular thing one time that God don't hear sinner's prayer. I don't know where all that came from, but I do know he hears sinner's prayer because he heard my cry and pitied my groan. And if he did not hear a sinner's prayer, none of us would be saved because that's the only way you can be saved is pray to save. It's the only way. Now, you can pray to save through hearing Bible studies. You can pray to be saved to hear him preaching. You can pray to be saved from hearing some songs that are, are gospel saturated, uh, but you still have to pray. Uh, and he goes on, he says, my supplications. Now, what's the difference? Even though it's a prayer, you hear the Bible talk about prayer and supplication. What is really the difference between prayer and supplication? Supplication is your entreaty. You're begging, uh, uh, asking for mercy. God heard it. Verse 2 say, because he inclined he, unto me, he bent over. Lord, uh, paying attention to me. You know how it is when, when you're talking to somebody and you know they're not paying attention. Hey, listen, pay attention to me. You can even tell, I shouldn't say this, but you can even tell when you're on the phone when a person really paying attention to you. You don't have to be around them. You'll hear and you'll know they're not paying attention to it. I always use this. Uh, I used to I always look like Carl Rubin Henley and it'd be football time. I said, Rev, you ain't listening. You're watching that game. Oh, bish, bish. I'll, I said, I'll call you when the game is over. You can just tell. You can pick up the vow. Same with the psalmist. He knew when God heard his cry. And I wonder how many times do you feel that God is listening to you and he... Uh, he hears you. Now notice what the psalmist say. Therefore, for this reason, because he heard my voice, he heard my supplication, he inclined his ear unto me. Uh, you began to pay attention to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. 
he is saying, because God has done this, I will continue. Let me turn to this in here. I will continue to uh, call on the Lord all the days of my life. What a great thing. Uh, he is saying, God heard me, and uh, I will continue to, to, uh, to listen to him. He, he went to God in his sorrow, and I said earlier that we need to go to God in our sorrow. And so for those who may or may not have the, the, the questions, what might keep us from talking to God about our sorrow? Have you ever had sorrow and then uh, talk to God about it? What would cause us sometimes to 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 uh, to not carry our sorrow to the Lord? You know, we sang that song, especially in our black tradition. What a friend we have in Jesus! All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege it is to take everything to God in prayer. But I'm wondering, my brothers and sisters. Do you take everything, and what might cause us not to take our grief and sins to the Lord? Okay, uh, the psalmist goes on here, and he talks a little further. And uh, the next verse, he says, "The death, uh, uh, cords of death, encompassed me, and the terrors of Sheol came upon me." I found distress and sorrow. He said, I was stressed all out. I found distress. I was stressed all out. The sorrow of death compassed me. The pains of hell grabbed me. So what he is saying, it was like being held down, roped in, Jonah uh, in the belly of the whale. Uh, he was in that death situation. Uh, off times or sometimes in childbirth and now they're better at detecting these things and better able to deal with it but sometime a baby would be born with the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck and usually uh, perish during childbirth because it cuts off the oxygen this is a dire situation I wonder how many in this uh, listening tonight have really been in a situation where you were encompassed by sin and and ready to snuff off your life uh, when I preparing the lesson and thought about that I said more times that I've been encompassed and with cords wrapped around my neck than I would like to even think about however those are good things because God delivered me every time I mean it's time and time again I can think of it and I don't think I'm on the island by myself but if you think about it many times God has um, saved us. Now he said he saved us. This word Sheol is uh, a word for the realm I call or the place of the dead. Uh, it is the Hebrew word for hell. It's a concept of Hades. Uh, it was a realm and it was more or less always looked at but not always a guarantee. Uh, that it represented a place of the unrighteous dead. That's why when you're studying the Bible, you've got to look up the words to see what it is because not all the time it is talking about the unrighteous dead. It is sometimes talking about the unrighteous dead. There's times when it's talking about the realm of dead, just where dead people live, good and bad. So that's why word study or at least study the context don't just grab one verse and pull it out but study the context and you would have a better understanding I think I have someone coming in uh, to say something good evening pastor I want to go back to what you said is there a movie that makes you cry yes brother Henry Pickens stated the passion oh yeah thank you brother Pickens, I didn't think about that when I was listening to that. Let me just share something with you on that. I went to see it. I'll never forget it. It was in Delray. They're on that uh, movie down on US-1. It did not make me cry because I didn't watch it. I couldn't, I couldn't see it. I closed my eyes and left the movie, so <laughs> it didn't make me cry. But that is one that, that will make you cry. 
Sister Shirley Lynch also said the passion, and she said imitation of life. What was the second one? Imitation of life. Okay. And uh, you also um, asked a question. Brother Henry Pickens is answering, Pastor, sometimes we don't think we deserve to talk to the Lord, although we know he said my burden is light. Okay. Sometimes that will keep us from bringing it to him. But remember when those times that come from the evil one, he said, I, I would in no wise cast you out. Those that come to me, uh, he, and, and, and that is real. So that was a good point. Just remember, he promised he would always hear us, and he keep on hearing us over and over again. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, again, uh, when have you called out to God for mercy like the psalmist? Now, the psalmist is crying out. Uh, I didn't read it in a dramatic way, but, but it is a dramatic thing because when you look at it, you'll see the, the punctuation uh, uh, that he called upon the Lord. Uh, let me give you an illustration, and while you're thinking of that, and I'll move further when it's the time you call out to God for mercy, like the psalmist. That was a young man uh, that, that I know. He was out fishing uh, one day, and he looked up, and he saw something on the water, and he didn't recognize what it was, and he seen what it was, and he said, that's the Lord, bid me to come. And he stepped out the boat, and the Lord said, come, uh, and he stepped out on the water, and he began to look at the winds and the waves. Uh, Brother Pickens, that's a good one. And he cried out, Lord, save me. The same way the, the psalm is here, and there are several other psalms you'll see where he said, Lord, save me. So what I'm saying is it don't take a revival to cry out to the Lord. Uh, and he didn't have time to do a revival. <laughs> uh, he, he called on the Lord. So sometimes our emotions, we may not physically be strangling, but our emotions tangles us up uh, in imminent danger. Uh, he said, I found trouble so bad that I could hardly function. Have you ever been so down that you couldn't even hardly function? That's what he's saying. I could hardly even uh, function. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. And again, that's an idiom in the Old Testament to, uh, uh, to talk about praying when we're calling on the Lord. He beseeched them. Uh, he needed something that he could not do. And, and there again may be one for that question about why do we sometimes not take our sorrows to the Lord. It's because we think we can handle them. We think we can do them. But the psalmist found out this is something that I cannot handle. And, and, and there are some things in life uh, that we may not can handle. And then here's the other thing. Sometimes we know we can't handle it, but we just won't admit it. Uh, and so he, he said, deliver my soul, and God did deliver his soul. So that kind of takes us to the first five verses when he says, then uh, um, uh, I, can't, I call upon the Lord, I beseech him, save my life. That should be something that all of us are refreshed on, because if we have salvation, we ask God to save our life. Now, there may be one tonight who don't know that they're saved. You need to pray and ask God in sincerity to save your life. Let's look at uh, verses uh, 5 through 9. 5 through 9, uh, moving right along. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. He is of God, is compassion. So in this first verse, uh, God, he gives us, uh, some traits or characteristics of the Lord right there in verse 5 and they are uh, gracious uh, righteous and compassion now he says also in that verse 7 return unto thy rest rest in God who is a compassionate God toward us so gracious in this case that's one of the things in verse 5 gracious means a really a act of bending a stooping in kindness to an inferior. It's the hand of a king reaching out to a beggar. That's what salvation is. The king reaching his hand out to us as beggars. Someone who show favor. Uh, especially taught those who don't uh, 
feel like they need it, as Brother Pickens say, or don't, uh, of, of whom it's not required anything of. So in the New Testament, and in, in, that's in that too, it's called grace. Uh, people don't think it was grace in the Old Testament, but grace was everywhere. God will do good for us as far more than what we deserve. Uh, the next word, it was righteous, uh, just. Uh, it's a sense of being and acting right. Uh, of course, right requires a standard, and God is that standard. His eyes are purer than to look on evil. He acts in a way that's true to himself. He, uh, you know, they got this thing, uh, to yourself be, uh, thyself be true. God will do right by us at all times. So, Brother Henry, when it feels like it, we don't want to reach out to him because we don't feel that we deserve it. Remember, uh, Dr. Kennedy would always say, P.S., we didn't deserve it then, we don't deserve it now, but yet we have it. And this last and this compassion, uh, the Lord is not just a God who loves, he is love. Uh, he shows tender affection uh, to be compassionate as a father pities his son, so also do the Lord pity those who love him. Uh, the new the NIV said the Lord protects the unwary, the ones who don't even deserve it. Uh, the psalmist discovered the Lord protection in his own life. Uh, when was the last time God gave you uh, protection? He is my shield, my rock, and my salvation. Uh, so God is our protector. Uh, there's an old popular adage, and that adage, it, an adage is not in the Bible. So many people think it's in the Bible. But it's not, it's an adage. And this adage is, God help those who help themselves. That is not biblical. It's okay to use it, but don't say the Bible says that God help those who help themselves. Sometimes God expects us to do what we can to correct the situation that threatens us. So it ain't a passive situation. When we try to do all we can and we can't do nothing with it, then it's the time to turn it over to the Lord. He'll work it out. God help those who are overwhelmed by life circumstance, not those just help themselves and realize they can't help themselves. The psalmist said, when my heart is overwhelmed, hear my cry, oh Lord. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to that rock that is higher than I. Uh, yeah, if it's something we can do, but most of the time we're going to be in these dire situations and nothing we can do. People need the Lord. Uh, and, and the problem of men is coming to the point of admitting that we lead the Lord. That's the biggest fight in coming to salvation. We don't feel like we need him. We feel like we can do it. Uh, he said he was brought low. Some translations say he was distressed, oppressed, mentally, spiritually, physically fatigued. I don't know whether you ever been there. Thank God if you've never been there. And it is an experience if you've been there. He was ready to just drop. See, I couldn't go no further. I would have fainted, some would say, if I had not believed and seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We're going to see it. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. We'll see it on the other side. Uh, but he was ready to do the job. Now look what he says in that, that portion. Return unto thy rest, O soul. So why could he say return to the rest? He said, hey, it's nothing to worry about. I got it now. Uh, all I need to do is return and rest. That's why the Bible says, Come unto me, all ye who are, who, who are heavy laden, who are got a heavy load. Come unto me, and I'll give you rest for your soul. Now, here's another question we need to be looking at as we go through. What are some things that have brought you healing during the time of grief? If you've been through grief, and if you lost someone through death, you've been through some grief. Some things are gr grievous more than others. Uh, all death is unexpected. Uh, early deaths, all of these things. Think about that. Uh, he said, return uh, to thy rest. Why could he rest? Because God had dealt bountifully with him. And I said on Sunday, that means he had dealt thoroughly. He didn't leave no stones unturned. He didn't deal with you and say, I'll be back 
uh, this afternoon to finish the job. He dealt bountiful with them to treat a person well in the fullest of sense. Uh, so to see the full effect of what the psalmist said in verse 8, we need to look back at verse 3. So he said, for you have rescued my soul from the death. Verse 3 says, save me, Lord, uh, um, rescue me from death. God did it. Verse 8 is the response to the appeal to verse 4 where he says, save me. It's a critical change in his life. And somewhere along the line, all of us should have experienced the same thing, the hope. Here's the hope. Uh, look what he said. He has delivered me from death, rescued. Now, someone uh, explained to me, when was you rescued? That should be at least one time we've all been rescued. I'm not talking about you was in Katrina and the water and uh, some uh, first responder. Uh, the police had to come and rescue you, and those things are good. But tell me a time uh, that you uh, was rescued. Tell me a time. What are some things brought you healing during the time of grief when you have been rescued? Um, so uh, he said, listen, my feet were stumbling. Uh, now I'm steady. How many times have you been entangled to the point of death in sin? Think about that. How many times have you been entangled in sin that led right to death door? You don't have to go all the way to the summit. I can tell you tonight. I know that God will deliver you at death door. How many times I have been entangled to the point of death, and yet God came and rescued me. Uh, and he said, because that, I have hope. I've been delivered from Sheol, the realm of the death. I'll walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I see someone coming in. Pastor, Sister Shirley Lynch says, I'm lost about when Jesus died. He went below hell, true or untrue? See, that's, yeah, okay, good question, Sister Shirley. These things are deeper than the surface, and, and that's a good question. I, we taught on that once, and I do need to do a better job on preserving my teaching. <laughs> so here's what it is, Sister uh, uh, Lynch. He went to the realm of the dead. Now, some people say he went, preached to the souls, changed down. He went into the grave. In that context, it was talking about the place where dead people go. He went into Joseph's new tomb. It's where he went. That is, can be translated sometime hell, but we can't make it mean that that was the place of the unrighteous. That's the key. It was all kind of dead people there in the realm of the dead. Let me put it this way. Maybe this will give you a picture. When you go down Old Dixie, when you pass, if you're heading north on Old Dixie uh, from 45th Street and you're heading north, you pass a place called Royal Palm Cemetery. That is absolutely the realm of the dead. I passed there early this morning. I didn't even see a car parked over there. It was definitely the realm of the dead. It should have been nothing living human-wise out there. So hopefully that helped. Thank you, Pastor. Sister Jill Stessner says, my church friends reached out to me and helped me with my grief. All right. That is good. Sister Stessner saying, uh, church friend, and that's what it is. Because one of the things I think we talked about, uh, I may have put that question on there. Sometimes I put some question on there. Who do you know that was a blessing to you during the time of your grief? Thank God. Now, remember, Sister Jill, uh, pass the blessing on. Uh, when someone else, you see them in grief, you do the same thing. This particular session that, that we're talking about, Psalm 116, verses 5 through 9, here's what I want you to take away from there. The Lord is gracious. He's righteous. He's compassionate when dealing with us. Therefore, we as his children ought to be gracious 
righteous and compassion when we're dealing with others. Just like God dealt with us, we ought to deal with others. Here's another thing. Uh, those who humble themselves before the Lord will find his help. The Bible says the Lord eyes roam to and fro over the earth to show himself strong to those who look for him. Here's another thing. You can rest in the Lord knowing he has accomplished good for us. And finally, life, strength, and hope come to us as we walk in the Lord's presence. This is what he's talking about. I'll walk before the Lord in the land of the living. He knew God could see him. Walk is not it's our testimony. It's our man of life. What do people see when they see us? When we walk before in the land of the living, we ought to have a testimony. Now, having a testimony don't necessarily mean that you get a chance to use it in a church capacity during the assembly of the church. But you get a chance to share your testimony with those who need it. If the person is saved, you give them the testimony to be able to encourage them. If they are not saved, you give them the testimony to witness to them that God can do for them the same thing that he done for you. That's uh, uh, what uh, we're talking about. S now, someone who came and, and, and helped you, uh, what are some things that may have brought you to uh, grief? What are some things that have brought you healing? during the time it can be someone it can be God word uh, but you need to think about that so let's look now at um, verses 15 uh, through 17 what different perspective on death did the poet come to understand how did he see himself in relationship to God what commitment did the psalmist make concerning the Lord he said I will walk before the Lord all the days of my life Let's look at verse 15. Here's what it says. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his holy or godly one. O Lord, surely I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your handmaid, who have loosed my bonds. To you I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. Oh, may, be, may it be in the presence of all his people. I'm not going to hide this. In the courts of the Lord house, in the midst, O oh, Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Now, what's going on here? Verse 10, I believe when I said I am greatly afflicted, I said in my alarm, all men are a liar. I shall lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vow to the Lord, or oh, may it be in the presence of all his people. The psalmist testified at least of two truths here. He's saying, first, the faith that his faith, my faith, could sustain me. It was not just wishful thinking. It wasn't just, uh, okay, I'll think about this, wishful thinking to get me. Second, he could depend on God. Though people would let him down. He said, folk had lied on them. Uh, he said, let uh, the word say, let all men be a liar. But let the word of God be the truth. Uh, verse 15, the poet moves to a conclusion. Uh, he started out 1 and 4, verses 1 through 4, confessed. He had a personal struggle with the prospect of death. And he returned to verse 15, and it's saying, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Remember what I said on Sunday for those who may have been there. I'll repeat that again. Uh, death uh, uh, was honorable to God for the saints. Uh, he did take notice. Uh, and though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Precious means valuable, prized. Remember we talked about uh, Ezekiel uh, and saying that uh, I take no uh, delight in the death of people. Uh, but he was talking about his saints, people who are saved. 
Second Peter chapter three verse nine. Uh, but he 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 takes he don't take anyone death lightly. He places high value on on the life of every person. He never would abandon them, though they might refuse him, though they walk through the valley of shadow of death. God would be there. For the psalmist, that meant that while he faced danger of death and felt utterly alone, truly he was not alone. What are some benefits of trusting and thanking God during times of grief? Well, that's what David did. He praised the Lord. Think about that, and somebody can weigh in on that. He could trust the Lord to be with him because the Lord valued him as his own, as does he all of believers. Does that not mean that faithful, uh, faithful are exempt from death? The, the, the righteous die just like anyone else. But it does mean as we come to know Christ, the kind of life God gives us bursts the bonds of death and frees us to a life eternal in his presence so let's talk about eternal life for a moment because eternal life when you talk about it to the average Christian they short change it because eternal life they believe and in their mind whether they said or not starts the moment we die that is not true eternal life starts the moment we're saved Otherwise, it wouldn't be eternal. It starts at that moment and never stops. It don't start when we die. We already have eternal life. That's why we will never die as long as Jesus lives. That's why saints don't die. They just sleep away. Again, they go into that realm of the dead. They go to Royal Palm. They go to whatever cemetery. They lost their seat. They are in the realm of the dead. but they're still living. We will never die as long as Jesus lived. So, um, such reflection led to an outburst of praise and commitment. We're thinking about all of these people who have uh, lost their lives and losing their lives. We should be really uh, praising God for the life in which he gave us. What are some benefits of trusting and thanking God during that times? That's what David did. O oh Lord, he affirmed, I am thy servant. He acknowledged his heritage, his upbringing as well. The son of your handmaid, meaning the son of a female servant. The children of slaves were the property of the master. This, the phrase, is a way of affirming the complete servitude and the fullness of his allegiance to his master. Serving in the Old Testament uh, is one of the greatest tiles anyone could claim for those who were faithful to the Lord. David said, I've been faithful. I'm faithful to the Lord. Their role as servants was a way of acknowledging the superiority of the Lord God. He is the sovereign master who blessed to be his servant, to be counted as a member of his divine household. Because the Lord had loosed his bonds, set him free. He gave what? Thanksgiving. That was part. Now, he talks about verse 19. Uh, in the course of that, in the course of the Lord's house, in the midst of Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Well, we're praising the Lord. We're not in the midst of his house, but we can still thank him. Why is it important to thank him? Because he's gracious, he's righteous, he's compassionate. By giving thanks, sacrifice is showing that we do love the Lord. So accompanying the sacrifice uh, would be an open confession in church. We're not in there. To call upon the name of the Lord in this verse may allude to both confession and the proclamation. He would do so in the presence of the Lord, but also in the presence of all his people. That's why it says, don't forsake yourself of the assembling for such the custom had. It wasn't talking about this pandemic, but it's talking about when people was purposely not coming to church. We come to church to be encouraged by one another. We come to church to praise the Lord and hear the praises of his people. 
So he urges us in this last section here to praise the Lord. Now, admittedly going through, it can be hard to feel thankful in the midst of your circumstances that causes us grief, loss of a loved one. You may not get up during the eulogy or when the person you know died and praised the Lord, but you still have praise in your heart. But it's those very moments that we need to remember God and all he has done for us. When we think about the Lord and his goodness and all that he's done for us, my soul cry out for the Lord. We ought to be able to, to use those moments. So a focus on God fueled by thanks keep us from falling into despondency. Sometimes grief comes to the point where people are paralyzed. They're immobile. That's the word I'm looking for. They can't even do anything. But when we think about how good God has been, think about sometimes how many times we've been entangled by death, how many times that um, uh, uh, we, our life could have been snuffed out and God came and he saved us. A life of despondency, devoid of hope, is what Jesus' death and sacrifice saved for us. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. He gave his life. We are secured. He has us. He's got, uh, um, he got us secure. And we ought to think of that. How have times of grief and sorrow in your life refined your faith in God? How have the grief that God allowed come into your life changed your relationship, increased your faith instead of decreasing it. Think about it. Here are some truths that, that we need to remember. The, what, uh, the Lord treasure his people. He does not leave them alone in the darkest hour. Again, he promised he would never leave us nor sink us. What a privilege it is to be a servant to the Lord. We sang that song so when you sing a song, you need to internalize it and believe it. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a privilege to carry everything to the Lord. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because you can sing a lie just like you can tell a lie. It doesn't matter. If you're saying it's a privilege and you don't believe it's a privilege, it's a lie. Uh, thanks to the Lord for his faithfulness to hear and act on his behalf. I see someone coming in. Pastor, Brother Henry Pickens says, Pastor, could we say the Lord went wherever the souls are not necessary the grace? Better repeat that I one again. I repeat that. Pastor, could we say the Lord went wherever the souls are not necessary the grace? Well, he went physically to a grave. He went physically to a grave, uh, Joseph New Tomb. They didn't have a whole lot of them lined up like they do at Royal Palm. But he did go into the grave. And that's what it meant when it said he stayed in the heart of the earth for three long days. And he got up and stood on resurrection ground. So he was in the realm of the dead for three days. Three days is significant because in that context, in those days, people say the spirit left the body after three days. So that was that swoon theory that he wasn't really dead, uh, were resuscitated, but he stayed in the heart of the earth for three days. Per th perhaps it is three days when your body, rigor mortis, I may not pronounce the word right, but rigor mortis began to sit in. Your body began to de decay. That's why I say his body shall not see decay. And prior to the decay, he got up. So I hope that shares some light uh, for you on that. Uh, I hope that did. Uh, here's the final thing I want you to take away, uh, and then I'll close out with some things. While we can never pay God back for his goodness, we can love him, trust him, praise him today and evermore. If there's ever a time that we need to love God, trust him, praise him, 
today and forevermore. We don't know what the day holds, less long tomorrow. We s and so I want you to, to, uh, to remember that uh, and uh, I want you to remember that. Now, uh, what I want us to finally do after a great lesson like this, it means nothing if we don't live it out. We have to live out. Every lesson we are responsible for, uh, we need to live out these things. And I want you to listen at this as we get ready to move toward a closing. If there's any other time when our emotions are so raw as we, when we grieve the death of someone dear to us, it is a hurt unlike most uh, other hurts. And we're talking about the realm of the dead. When we are confronted with the reality of separation, that is what death is, the great separator. Grief expresses itself in various ways. It doesn't go away quickly. Uh, just talking to someone recently, it can sometimes just be a song. You're doing all right. Uh, it can just be a smell. It can just be a gift. Uh, Christmas time is a special time. And Sister Stishon has talked about someone helping us. We need to remember the grief that people are uh, faced with lockdown coming back for Christmas uh, so suppressing it grief is not to be denied suppressing it will lead to other emotional issues later on so feel the pain let the tears flow however even then grieve with hope understand this that we don't grieve as the world without any hope because we know Christ died and we have hope listen at this my brothers and sisters how about thinking about your own death? From time to time, we are all brought face to face with the reality of death. Have you thought about your death? Have you come face to face with mortality, with illness? Disease goes on rampant, storms rage, this accident occurs. It is those times we can get weighed down with sorrow, pain, struggling, accompanying, looking into the doctrine of death. Because we have never died before. The unknown may be frightening to us. The thought of separation from loved one grieves us. It is that time as well we need the hope of eternal life in heaven. Remember, nothing can separate us from the love of God. We do need to sometimes sit down and think about our death. Go back, read Psalm 116. It's a psalm of love. It's a psalm of thanksgiving. For the deliverance of God, for the precious ones from death. No matter what grief you're going through, no matter how you're grieving, God has a bomb in Gilead. We need to claim the promise of God, of the hope that he died, he took the stain from death. It has no more dominion over the people of God. And when we realize that and understand that, then we'll be able to praise God in the land of the living just like the psalmist did. Praise the Lord for his goodness. Trust him even to death. We are secure because nothing can separate us from the love of God. I know I talked a little bit uh, before, and I don't want to get off into that particular chasm, but nothing we can do if we are saved that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing past nor present. And let me tell you something. If we are saved and we can be lost, then we are not secure. Nothing can separate us. I know some of these issues of suicide and these things are very heavy issues. But God has rescued us from that. If he hadn't, then he don't know the future. He know how every one of us is going to die. He know how every one of us is going to leave, and he either can't save people who are going to commit suicide, or if people who commit suicide, they'll still save. Nothing, my brothers and sisters, can separate us. David was rescued. We should be rescued. And remember, if you're on the night, you had a rescue when he saved us from sin and shame. God bless you. Don't forget. Uh, it is a time of heightened grief. Minister to someone. Reach out to someone, especially if they recently lost a loved one. 
uh, reach out to those who have been locked down, people with underlying conditions that can't go out, can't do things. Remember me in the tenderness of that mercy. Remember what I said the attributes of God was? He was Christ, gracious, he was righteous, and he was compassionate. And because of that, and the way he had dealt with us, we are required, we are commanded to go and be gracious to people, be righteous with them, and be compassionate. Don't forget, our grief uh, ministry it is starting up after the first of the year. If you're interested, you need to let us know by filling in uh, one of the cards, go into the chat box, and let us know so that we can be uh, put you in the grief ministry. All of us need it. The last time it was a great session. Uh, I do believe, if time permit, I will be a part of it again, again and again. It's very much needed. It's all around us. God bless you. God keep us our prayer. I'm going to close with a word of prayer. And uh, let us remember the families that are in grief. Uh, the young man I talked with today, uh, Ted Odom, who is going through this series. He lost his toes. He lost half of his feet a day later. Now he's lost up to his ankle. You know the routine on um, uh, diabetes. And let us pray for him. So let's pray. Our Father, our Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all things. We thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, for what you are providing for us. We could look in all of the things that are going on, the election, the split in the nation, and Corbett, uh, Corbett uh, deaths. But we want to see the opportunity to minister in a time like this. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunities we have taken. And help us not to be like the one talent man who wouldn't risk. Help us to be the people who take risks that we love one another. Help us to have an eye. We pray for those who are in grief that you would show us that we would minister to them in the capacity in which we are able to do. Uh, we ask your blessing upon and remember the uh, uh, Velma and Lawson family and those who are associated with the families with the loss of loved ones. It goes on and on and on. Thank you for the healing bomb you've brought uh, back this away for uh, Kenny Payne and his wife and others we may not call by name. Hear our cry, Peter our groan. Long as trouble rise, we will hasten to your throne. It is in the majestic name of Jesus Christ we pray and ask it all for his name's sake. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rest rule and abide now henceforth and forevermore. God bless you. And it's good to see all of you all, uh, and we will see you again on Sunday. God bless.